Welcome to the DK Kim Foundation lecture series offered by the Center for Asian Business at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. This program is funded by a grant from the DK Kim Foundation in Ontario, California. This is a perfect time right now to talk about North Korea. Uh, not because of all the things that have been going on this past year, but we've also had very interestingly, probably about a 65, 70 day hiatus where the North Koreans have been pretty quiet. So this is a great time for us to then think about and catch our breath as to what's happened over the last nine months and to take stock of what's been happening. So my talk with you well, probably be about 30, 35 minutes. I'll try to do that as fast as I can in that respect, open it up. But what I want to do is answer two questions that are always asked of me when I'm talking to the media, when I'm doing an interview or when I'm talking with the newspaper. The two questions are, what's the real threat? Why are you concerned? And the second thing is, why is North Korea doing what it's doing? We don't understand. So I'm going to answer these questions for you. And understanding, and this is my prediction, that North Korea is not going to stay quiet for very long, North Korea is going to be back in the news one more time. And so this being a university, I thought I would do is distill some observations that I put together over the last 25 years that I've been watching North Korea, and some tips or observations that are going to help you as students and consumers of the news, because you're going to hear, be hearing this a lot um, in the media over the next several months, maybe a year, for you to be a more critical thinker and critical consumer of what you hear and what you read. Okay, does that, does that make sense? Okay, so what I thought I would do is start off, whatever I have a talk on North Korea, I start off with this photo. Um, keep that in the back of your mind. This is a, for those of you who don't know, this is the Korean Peninsula. This is South Korea. This is Seoul, a mega, a mega I mean a huge, metropolitan area to 25 million people. This is North Korea. This is Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea. This is Japan and part of China, okay? So the picture can say a thousand words. I'll just leave it at that. So keep that in the back of your mind. So a little context first. Plowshares Mission, the organization I'm with, we're a nonprofit. We've been in existence for 30 some, 35 years. Our mission is to reduce and eliminate the threat of nuclear weapons. So obviously we're very interested in North Korea. And for those of you, uh, the first nuclear weapon you know was Hiroshima, 15 kilotons. Um, for those of you, again, who can't see, this is Manhattan, and this is what the blast would look like. 15 kiloton weapon. Now, I'm curious here, since we're at a university, how many nuclear weapons are in the world right now? Does anyone know? Anyone care to guess? One guess. 2,000. One more? Okay, so that's getting better. There are currently 16,000 nuclear weapons in existence in the world right now. At the height of the Cold War, during the 60s and 70s and 80s, 70,000 nuclear weapons were in existence. And the most powerful weapon was called the Soviet Tsar Bomb, 50 megatons. All right, so we're talking about 50,000 kilotons with this, is, this explosion of Manhattan is 15. Just some context. All right. So what I want to do is tell you where we are now and what the current status of nuclear weapons is in North Korea and what we're, what we've been, what's been in the news. Let me say this. If US policy and the international pol uh, uh, policies toward North Korea continue as they are, which is a, my belief, is a uh, benign neglect or, in a sense, relying on sanctions to make North Korea change its course. Mark my words, North Korea in the next five to 10 years will have a small nuclear arsenal capable of hitting the United States. It has, at this point, 25 to 30 nuclear weapons worth of nuclear material. That's the key stuff that explodes and creates these large explosions. Give you another statistic. They produce one nuclear weapons worth of material every eight weeks. 
one nuclear weapons worth of material every eight weeks. Their sixth test, whoops, ah, sorry. Their sixth test, which was a few months ago, a couple months ago, was its biggest ever. 17 times the size of Hiroshima. This test here, which was on the 3rd of September. And they had a test, if you recall, the year before. And, that, and the sixth test was about 12 times larger. And we believe the sixth test was, in fact, a thermonuclear device. In other words, a hydrogen bomb. So that's where we are right now. And they are probably will do another test to improve and what we call miniaturize, make it smaller. So that's where we are on the nuclear weapons. Where are we on the missiles? Well, North Korea has an incredible array of missile, uh, has an incredible array of missile capabilities. They have been working on this for many, many years. They have uh, worked on uh, putting together a um, short-range missiles, medium-range missiles, intermediate-range, and ICBMs. They have various platforms, and this is just an illustration of what these are. This is a mobile technology where it can move. This is stationary from a platform, and they're actually working on submarines. And they're also working on, this is a very important distinction, they're also working on liquid versus solid fuels. Liquid fuels take longer to load, and they're very temperamental. If you can master the solid fuel technology, you can get them up and moving very, very quickly. Um, and they're harder to locate because you can move them and put them on mobile platforms. So the idea is the, 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 the United States used to be able to say, we know where these missiles are because they used to only have this, uh, this stationary platform. So the idea was you could always do a, a unilateral strike and just hit it whenever you wanted to. With this technology, solid fuel, and with a submarine with solid fuels, you can't do that. So if you miss, or if you don't even know where it is, there is an assurance of a uh, reciprocal strike. This is what they're working on. Now, the thing that we're all worried about most recently over the last several months has been their missile ranges. Now, we know, as again, I said they were uh, short, range, medium, and here's the long-term, long-range missiles, ICBM, that they're capable of theoretically. And this is in Korean, but this is what the launch has looked like during that period of time. There was one on uh, September, I mean, uh, July 4th, and there was one on uh, July 28th, and it goes way up in the air and comes back down again. If you extend it, this is where theory, actually, why we think they're prob probably capable of hitting the United States. Now, I say probably and maybe. Part of it is a combination. Not only do you have to have a missile that can shoot and go the distance, you also have to be able to make a nuclear device that's small enough to mount on top of it, and you have to make sure that, and, and, and be able to carry that. So the heavier the particular warhead, the less farther it will go. So our belief is that there probably wasn't, there wasn't very, we're not sure what was actually in these missiles. So we're not assured that North Korea has that capability right now. But let me just say, tell you right now, it is simply a matter of time. So that's where we are right now on the missiles. So let me go to the question that people always ask me. What is the real concern and what is the real threat? So let's go about what the real concern is and what the real threat. I'll tell you what I am not concerned about. I am not concerned about a preemptive nuclear strike on the United States, despite what you're hearing. I'm not that as concerned about that. The reason being, and this is something that people are not talking about a lot, deterrence. The notion of deterrence is alive and well on the Korean Peninsula. North Korea understands that if it decided to do something like that, it would cease to exist. What we have on the Korean Peninsula is a correlation of forces that heavily favors, at this point, the United States, South Korea, and our allies. And so therefore, if you think about intent and capability, we're always, we are, which is how you uh, operationalize a threat, they didn't have the capability for the very longest time. Now they're getting very, very close. But again, I submit to you, and we can talk about this in the question and answer, that they don't have the intent to do so. 
So what is the real threat? Well, it's a variation. And the real threat is what I call miscalculation. That is what I'm very much concerned about right now. And what do I mean by that? I'm talking about calculation or a mistake where we blunder in to something that no one actually wants. The military option in many ways is not an option because if there were to be a conflict, Seoul, a city of 25 million, would be at risk. So the only way that we talk about having a conflict intentionally or that it happening would be through a miscalculation and a mistake. Now think about this. There's a huge number of militaries right now on the Korean Peninsula. North Korea has a million man army. The United States has something like, uh, has around 30,000 in Korea, 50,000 in Japan. And the South Koreans have a, a military of 435,000 along with a lot of reserves. That's a lot of people. And when you have military exercises that are going on in the peninsula that happen in the spring, and that happen in the, uh, mostly in the spring, which, which are more operational, things can go wrong. What happens? So we have a new, new Korean leader, okay, who's constantly trying to push the envelope. And so what happens if a missile goes off course and hits something that it shouldn't hit? What happens if there's a firefight in the, south, in the East Sea or the West Sea between military uh, vessels? Which is, and, or what happens if there's a firefight over the DMZ? Those three things have happened before. In fact, we had that uh, North Korean defector come across and there was firing that was going on. What if an American soldier, a South Korean soldier got shot? Would there be an exchange of fire? What would happen? And right now, you have uh, uh, the United States has sent three carrier groups to Northeast, to Northeast Asia. The last time that was done, three carrier groups, okay, was done in 2007. We have 12 F-35 uh, uh, Fighter, bomb, fighter planes that are deployed to the region. We have a number of submarines. What happens if something goes wrong? You can see where this can sort of escalate. The other factor, which is new, relatively new, is the Donald Trump, Kim Jong-un factor. Um, how do I describe this? Well, let me just say that uh, it's Kim Jong-un has been described as inexperienced, unpredictable, incredibly aggressive, and some other things. Arguably, you can say the same thing about our president. I'm not saying that. People in his own party are saying that. So when you put that into the mix, that seems to just make things a little bit worse. And then finally, let me say, uh, the, the, other, the, the other large concern that I have, as I said, if North Korea continues its production as it is, what we have now in 2016 is about 25 to 30. If they eight, one nuclear weapon every eight weeks, we're talking 100 nuclear weapons worth of material. Now, think about this. It's one thing to have one or two nuclear weapons. It's another thing to have 100. Why is that? Well, this is the other thing that I'm most concerned about, and probably is what I call the loose nukes problem. What is that? Let me describe it to you this way. If sanctions, we have a huge sanction regime coming on North Korea right now. What if those sanctions work, and the North Korean people are really hurting and hurting very badly? And let's say I'm a military person. Now, what, I'm, what you see here is a small bit of plutonium. There are two ways to make a bomb, plutonium and highly rich uranium. What you need to, do, to detonate a small nuclear device is something the size of a softball. That's it. And I guarantee you that the 30, 25 to 30 nuclear weapons of these pits, what we call these pits, are not all in one place. And if they make 100, I guarantee you they will not be in one place. They will be scattered throughout the country. All right. So what happens, so there are going to be various people, that's my, my assumption. So what happens then if North Korea, uh, if the, the, their sanctions are truly bone, bone crunching, and somebody comes up to a soldier who is in charge of guarding this material and says, I'll give you a million, five million dollars for this. Do you think there's a greater incentive for this person to sell it? I think so. The other thing is, let's say sanctions work, or heaven forbid, we get into a conflict, and then the regime collapses, and we get into some kind of fighting war of some fashion. 
It doesn't have to be catastrophic, although the chances are it probably will be. But even if it's not, what's going to happen is going to be a mad rush to find this material. And again, it's one thing if you have one or two nuclear weapons worth of material. It's another thing if you have 25 or 30. It's an entirely different thing if you have 100. And I guarantee you, I think, that the chances of us getting all 100 of those is probably zero. If one gets out, if one of these pits gets out, it will either blow up in the United States, Western Europe, or somewhere in the Middle East. So this is what I'm concerned about. For right now, it's not a concern, because from what we believe, they're fairly secure in North Korea. The regime is, for what we know, stable, and Kim Jong-un is in charge. But this is something we have to think about, and I guarantee you, people are not talking about this in the media, and, and in the op-ed you read, people are not talking about this as much as they should. So that's the real threat. And that's what I'm concerned about. So why does North Korea do what it's doing? That's what everyone asks, asks me as well. So one thing to keep in mind is that North Korea does, when North Korea has limited resources, very limited resources. And so when they do something, it's not going to be for one purpose. It's going to be for several. And when you look at what North Korea is doing, they probably will do it. You have to look at it through an internal lens, an internal, internal lens. How does it help the regime? An external lens, how does it help its external relations or get what it, what's, what it wants? And finally, is there a military purpose to what it is? So let me then clarify um, what I think is the North Korean strategic sort of thinking on this. Why does North Korea want nuclear weapons? Well, I think most North Korean watchers agree, and I think it make, to us it makes common sense. The number one strategic objective of the regime is to survive. They have to survive. And so the way, uh, based on conversations, I've been in a number of negotiations with North Korea uh, during, during my time. So my, my hypothesis is that there are three basic objectives that they have to achieve in order to, to attain that strategic end. The first is basically one of self-defense and what we call deterrence. It has to make sure that it is protected from attack and from intimidation, which is going to limit its freedom of movement. That's the first thing. The second thing is North Korea has had two bad decades. And so for them, they want to preserve this national myth about who they are to, 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 make, to keep the population um, loyal to the regime and to, uh, uh, to, um, to make sure that the myths that they are propagating are, stay intact. And the third is that they eventually need, there's an economic thing. There's an economic purpose of what they do. And that's because Kim Jong-un, in his first speech when he came to power, was he said to his people, and this is very important, he recognized, and this is unusual, that the North Korean people had suffered a great deal. And then he also said in his own, after that, that you need not suffer anymore. And then there was implicitly a commitment to make the economy better. So I will say to you that nuclear weapons supports all three of these particular goals. How? Self-defense, let me just put it to you bluntly. Nuclear weapons is a poor country's weapon. If you want to prevent yourself uh, from, from being attacked or stay, that's the way, that, or intimidated. Um, in negotiations, so in North Korea, their military, a lot of their infrastructure is starting to fall apart. It's very old. They don't have a lot of resources. They devoted it. They have to decide where they're going to devote their resources. In numerous, numerous negotiations that I had with North Koreans, and as a government official and non-government official, they, they've always said to me, if uh, um, Saddam Hussein had nuclear weapons, if Slobodan Milosevic in Yugoslavia had nuclear weapons, if Gaddafi had had nuclear weapons, they'd still be in power. 
And I'd probably say that that may be actually true. But that's what they think. Second thing, preserving the national myth is another way for them of having some self-respect. There are only nine countries in the world that have nuclear weapons. North Korea is one of them. They are on par with, the Soviet, with Russia, the United States, and China. South Korea, their bitter rival, does not have any at all. North Korea has put an incredible amount of resources, literally blood, sweat, tears, and their own treasure into developing this capability. And they've entwined this in terms of their national myth. And if they just gave it away with for nothing, um, the regime would probably fall. The North Korean people have sacrificed an incredible amount for this. And then finally, the economic purpose. Why do nuclear weapons support the economic uh, prerogative? Well, the argument here is that if they have, can assure their own security, they can devote their resources to the economy. Now, there's a good argument for this. At the end of the Cold War, the United States said to Northeast Asia, you concentrate all of your, what resources you have on economic development, we'll take care of your security. As a result, South Korea, Japan, the Philippines, other countries, the economic miracle. In China, there's another precedent for that. China, Deng Xiaoping in the late 1970s started economic reform. He said China could preserve itself and protect itself and therefore had to divert resources that were being used in a, in a uh, outdated military and push them to the economic reform that you see here. So this is what they're thinking about. If they feel secure, they can start devoting some of those resources into uh, the economy. And you can see, the last time I was in, in North Korea was in the 19, was in 2000, in 2000, and since that time, the economy has slowly getting better, from a very low level, granted, but it has continually got better, and that's what Kim Jong-un has to be able to show people. All right, so I've gone through those two questions. Now let's talk about how do we solve this? And what I would say is I think the most critical thing about this is understanding who your adversary is. And as I said, North Korea is going to be in the news over the next, will be in the news, guaranteed. I don't know when, and, and then when they will, it will be for a, very, for a number of months and for years, and it will continue. It's a full-time employment act for some of us. Uh, so let me give you some assessments and some observations here. Chances are, when you think of North Korea, you think of this. You think of military, starvation, need food, and just basically out in space. So let me, so you probably have those sort of stereotypes. OK, can understand that. Let me tell you some observations here for you all to think about. First observation is no one really knows what is going inside North Korea's leadership circle. Please remember that. You're going to hear a lot of people talking about what Kim Jong-un thinks or what he's doing. You know, none of us really, really know. But I'll tell you about North Koreans in general. They're not irrational and they're not crazy. Now, you're going to see a lot of experts talk about North Korean leadership decision making and what's going on behind the scenes. Again, pure speculation. We know a lot about North Korea. We know a lot about the negotiating process. I've been in scores of hours of negotiations with them. I know how they do negotiations. We know about the economy, particularly around China. And we know about the lives based on sort of interviews with defectors. So there's a lot we do know about. We knew a lot about Kim Jong-il. At the very beginning, when he first came out, we didn't know a lot. But then through a number of years of having engagement with the South Koreans and eventually the United States, we got to know a lot about Kim Jong-un. We know very little, I mean Kim Jong-il, the father. We knew a lot about the father. And uh, the Soviets knew a lot, and the Russians knew a lot about the grandfather, the founder of North Korea, Kim Il-sung. Kim Jong-un, don't know. The only American who has met Kim Jong-un is Dennis Rodman. <laughs> OK? So I will submit to you that the fixation and emphasis on is he in power, is he not in power, is he a puppet, he's not a puppet, I think really is beside the point. You've got to spend some time on that, absolutely. But you've got to focus on what's knowable. 
And what is knowable is how they act and the policies that they had. And they still continue to use intimidation, threats, and blackmail, and provocation to try to get what they want. And so from that standpoint, it doesn't matter who's in charge. Second observation, the high level attention that North Korea wants or needs for the United States to be successful, I don't think the United States has the capability to give. Why is that? This is just a function of my government experience here. Uh, the most important asset a president and senior policymakers have, and I'm not talking about when I was in government, I'm talking, I mean, me when I was in government, I'm talking about Secretary of State, I'm talking about undersecretaries, is their time. Think about what the United States and in fact President Trump has to juggle, and these are just some things. He's got a whole host of issues that he has to juggle. Every day, it's almost like drinking from a water hose. Kim Jong-un has a lot that he has to deal with internally, that's for sure, but it's relatively small. And so what is the implication of that? The implication is that North Korea will provoke when you're ignoring them or not paying them enough attention, which we've seen, or they're going to take advantage of the inattention and do something that is going to slip under the radar or some, will surprise you. And we've seen both of those, and we can talk about examples of that. Observation three, I believe North Korea will have always a distinct advantage over other countries in negotiations, particularly the United States. So why do I say that? Well, let me estimate over the last 20 years, the, North, the United States has had something like eight or nine US policy coordinators. This is the person in charge of coordinating and making sure the government policy towards North Korea is all uniform. The initial and the first North Korea policy coordinator was former Secretary of Defense William Perry, whom I worked for. Second one was Wendy Sherman, who was involved in the Iran negotiations under Obama, and another person I worked for. And since then, each one of the people who have become the North Korea policy coordinator, uh, 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 North, Pol uh, Korea, North Korea policy coordinator, has gone down in rank. And under each of those people, because of the way government works, is a turnover. Every three years within government, there are new, there are new uh, people who come into these positions. So under them, you have a series of people at our different levels who are there for three years and then are gone. There for three years are gone. Maybe we'll be at a low level and come back up, but they're always thinking about the next job. Let's contrast that to North Korea. These are the people who have been involved in North Korean negotiations, the key people for the last, I'd say, 25 years. And in fact, this person, this person, this person, this person, this person, and this person I've been in negotiations with and have, or I've met. They're all the same. They haven't wavered. And so what that means is that the North Koreans have kind of seen it all. Each person on the US side who comes in tries to do something new, but to the North Koreans, it doesn't seem new. And in some ways, they think they can, the North Koreans feel they can wait it out because they just wait until the next uh, changeover or the next administration. And then you got, it seems like they're starting over again. Observation four. The United States and media consistently underestimate North Korean resolve. I'm sorry to say that US assessments of the United, of US government assessments of North Korea have often been wrong. In the 1990s, everyone said Kim Jong-il, the father, was a playboy, was not very smart, and the regime would collapse. Well, in fact, he, the regime did not collapse, and Kim Jong-il, uh, Jong the father, proved to be rather clever. And it was very clear that he was very aware of the outside world. In the 2000s, Americans were so sure that the North Korea would never detonate a nuclear device, and in fact, and that the regime would collapse. Again, that was wrong. And then, 
In the 2010s, uh, during this period, people were talking about how the North Koreans would stop at what they're doing. They would, they would not continue producing nuclear material. Again, China would help. And uh, in fact, they continued to move forward. And because of this, we are constantly surprised by North Korean action. It catches us off guard. A great example was in the 2010s when in the space of uh, about six months, North Koreans actually did something very aggressive. They, uh, they torpedoed a South Korean vessel. I think there were about 47 or 46 sailors that were killed. And then they actually shelled a South Korean island that killed um, two civilians. And again, that took everyone by surprise. So that's one thing. We don't, we, 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 they, they always seem to surprise us with their actions. But we have another problem with respect to North Korea, and I call this other feature a lack of balance. Um, one day, North Korea is a joke, and the next day, the sky is falling. There's no in between. And this is a great example, this photo, and you can probably find examples more recently, but I, I really like this example. Um, during the 1912 missile, there was a missile test. There were two missile tests, or rocket tests, in 2012. And I remember. I was, on Fox, I was on Fox News commentating because the North Koreans were going to do this missile rocket test. It was a rocket test. And they had announced that they had brought foreign media in, and I was asked by Fox News almost on a play-by-play -play basis to talk about what the North Koreans were doing. And it was a very short kind of interview, uh, a sort of play-by-play -play thing, because what happened was after 90 seconds, after all this hoopla, the thing went off course and had to be blown up. And so what you saw was North Korea became a laughing stock in the media. And I can guarantee you the North Koreans were not happy about that. And because, as I said before, they, for the last uh, you know, two decades, they've had a tough time. So this was a very typical cartoon. Well, six months later, they actually succeeded. And this is what you saw on the, in the newspaper. So I will admit that North Korea is idiosyncratic. There is truly a strangeness about them. I can tell you stories about when I was there. You have stories about Kim Jong-il, about Disneyland. You talk about his haircut. But don't confuse that with security issues. In terms of security issues, the North Koreans are incredibly capable. And they have a resolve that they have demonstrated time and time again. And then finally. I hope that I'm proven wrong with this, but I haven't been proven wrong yet. As long as China has North Korea's back, there is little the US can do to apply pressure effectively. So what I mean by this is that there is this myth out here, out, he, out floating around, that China can solve this problem by itself. It cannot. Or, for a variety of reasons, it will not. So, in a sense, China is a necessary player in solving this particular problem if it's to be solved of North Korean nukes and missiles. But it is not the only country that can solve it. It's not a sufficient condition. So why is that? Why do I say this is the case? It's because of differing priorities. The US and the United States, I, I mean the China and the United States have differing priorities. We both agree that having a non-nuclear North Korea is the best thing to do. We want a non-nuclear North Korea, non-nuclear Korean peninsula. But as far as the Chinese are concerned, they are more, their highest priority is preventing a North Korea collapse and preserving the status quo. Why is that? Well, people do talk about hundreds, and thousands, hundreds of thousands of refugees coming into China. Uh, yeah, maybe. I think that's part of it. But ultimately, you have to go back to the Korean War. The Chinese entered the Korean War to prevent the United States from having troops along its borders. They had something like, I don't know the exact amount, something like 600,000 or so casualties as a result of that. So if North Korea collapses, presumably South Korea would become the successor government. And what China is worried about, quite frankly, is that the United States then will have troops that are capable of then going up to the border. And so until they, and as you know, China and the United States have their own issues. China, there are many in China, in particular the military fields, that China, that, that the United States is trying to keep China down. That the United States is surrounding China 
in order to prevent China from taking its rightful place as the next superpower. In China, they talk about, we're the rising superpower, the United States is the declining superpower, and the United States is trying to keep us down. So until we can figure out a strategic solution as to what happens, and very succinctly, until you can figure out what happens to US troops in South Korea, if North Korea changes and transforms, China is not going to change its basic policy. And the way it's been described to me is that the Chinese are going to, what, was it, what did they say? We are not going to let the North Koreans starve. Yet at the same time, we're not going to let them eat white rice. Okay? So with that, in the, for those of you, white rice is sort of considered, you know, back uh, when, uh, before the industrial age, where um, very wealthy people ate white rice all the time. And most people who are peasants, when they ate rice, they usually ate grain and mixed white rice in. So that's what, what they're saying. So they will continue to sort of what we call it sort of titrate um, to their advantage. All right. So why don't I just sort of stop it here? I don't know. Uh, so let me just end with this story here. And we can uh, then open it up for questions. Uh, and I'll try to do this very quickly. So to answer the original question, is war looming? I think the, the, the answer for me is it really depends. And it really depends if we can get over what I think is our greatest challenge. It's that we have a tendency, everyone does, to view people and countries through our own biases. And so I would submit that it's critical to know your adversary. I don't think the United States does in the case of North Korea, and that's going to be a problem. And how does that impact you as a as an operational practical level. Well, here's a great photo here about different interpretations. This is something that I was involved in. So this is uh, Jo Myung-no. He's the number two under the father, Kim Jong-il. And there's stories about Kim, uh, Jo Myung-no taking the father, Kim Jong-il, when he was a baby, and putting him on his back and taking him around China to avoid the Japanese during World War II. So there's a very close relationship between Kim Jong Il, the father, when he was in power, and Jo Myung Nook. Jo Myung Nook came to the United States after a period of time. Uh, my, we, we went to Pyongyang to pitch to the North Koreans about a possible deal and what it would look like and a, and a framework for discussing and resolving differences. Um, they didn't say yes, they didn't say no, but then after about a year, a year and a half, they sent Mr. Jo Myung Nook as the representative of the president of, of the leader of North Korea because Bill Perry, the former Secretary of Defense, went as the representative, personal representative of Bill Clinton. So there's this reciprocity here. It's very important. Okay. So Jo myung -na comes to California. I am here greeting him. We fly to Washington, DC. We have meetings at the Defense at the State Department. And the first question, so he comes in, we have these negotiation and negotiating table. First question he asked is, when am I going to meet the president? Because that was part of what he wanted to do. He wanted to meet the president. And we didn't have an answer for him because it was a scheduling issue. And they were very worried that we would basically, uh, only way I can say is that we would stiff them. Okay? Essentially, we would say, you're not going to, you're, sorry, it's not going to happen. Very concerned about that. We go in the negotiation, it goes, time out, right? One of these things, and they say, I want to meet the president. When is this going to happen? Well, eventually we get it scheduled. And so I remember distinctly, uh, we got it scheduled, they were pleased, and they said they had to, somehow they had to go back to their room, to their hotel, and somehow I got a message, I can't remember whether it was a phone call or a message, and they said, you won't believe this, but he changed his clothes. And I said, what? So when, let me just, when we were at the State Department having these meetings, he was in coat and tie. But for meeting with the president, he changed his clothes, and he wore this full dress uniform. I said, okay, well, I mean, we can't, you know, that's what's happening. So he meets the president in this full dress uniform, and this photo is taken along with, an, with others. And the scuttlebutt that you hear and the take that you hear is kooky North Korean. He has all these medals. Who is he to come to the White House in this kind of show of brashness and military bravado, et cetera, et cetera? When I saw this photo, I clapped my hands and I said, this is good news. And the reason why I said it was good news was because even in a totalitarian, authoritarian dictatorship, you cannot change a country on a dime. 
it takes a, it's like a huge ship that you slowly have to turn. And if you have been drummed into your head for your whole lives that the United States, the United States is the evil force for all the suffering that you heard, and to be told, right, that that's no longer the case, it takes a while to happen. So when Joe Myung Nuk, what he says, he said, I believe, was that um, in the conversation, the United States need not be enemies forever, something to that effect. So my point is that this photo, which was run in the New York Times, I believe, or version of it, was not for American papers or the United States. This was for the North Korean people. And what it was saying is that this guy, Joe Myung-nuk, was the head of the military. He was the marshal of the military, the vanguard, the protector of the North Korean people. And with this, and sure enough, this photo was ran everywhere in North Korea. And all the papers, um, and there were, uh, I mean, I'm sure, on TV. And what this photo is saying is that, get ready, times are going to change. That's where I, that's my interpretation of this particular photo. And as it turns out, we, uh, Bill Perry, I recommend you can all look in the New York Times. There's a podcast where former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry talks about how close we were to a, what he believes was a deal um, on these nuclear weapons and missiles. And uh, for a variety of reasons, it, the, the Bush administration decided not to pick it up. They were part of the axis of evil and they went another path. And so this is a perfect example, I believe, that if you don't understand your adversary, you're, you can and very likely will come up with the wrong conclusion and the wrong policy outcome. So for North Korea, ends justify those means. So for them, everything is existential. So I think the question that you're asking is missile defense effective. My bottom line is, short answer is no. It's political. It's going to make people feel good about it. But for example, that missile that went over China, uh, Japan, too high. None of our systems, Aegis, Patriots, uh, THAAD, could hit that thing. The only way you can do it, the only way you can do it is if you have a narrow launch window, you're very close relatively close in the sea to that launch point that maybe you can get out. It's very hard to do that. The only way you could have got that missile uh, that went over Japan because it was so high was when it was coming down. And by then it was over Japan, it didn't matter. Um, and as far as theater ballistic uh, about, uh, uh, what is it, uh, ballistic missile defense, ground missile defense that's in Alaska, Alaska and um, California. So, let me put it to you this way. Again, this just shows how, 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 thought, how thoughtful in the sense, how, how much the North Koreans think through what they're trying to demonstrate. If you recall, the North Koreans in the beginning of this year shot six missiles in tight configuration. Um, what they were demonstrating was basically saying, look, the missile defense, you'll say, is accurate at X num number percent. Well, you know, that's under ideal conditions under ideal conditions, all right? Now, if you talk about all the patriots, someone, one of our former, one of our grantees calculated, well, and for every missile that comes in, I think they calculate you need to have four missiles. So missile defense consists of, com of a computer, radar, and a missile. Now, for them to hit this missile that's coming out, there's this, they say, X 25% or 50% or whatever it is, 75% accuracy, based on shooting four missiles, each one having this accuracy rate, and then moving forward. So the way these missile defense worked was in an under ideal conditions, you know it was gonna be launched and it did it this way. North Koreans have basically demonstrated that they can overwhelm this. So if you, do, you think about what we have here, North Korea, the United States can defend, because there are four missiles for each battery that we have, probably 11 nuclear weapons. After 12 or 13, even if they all worked and hit something, it's all over with. We couldn't, we'd be overwhelmed. And that's what North Korea is trying to say, all right? So that is my, I, I believe we need to continue to research missile defense. I think if it's going to protect us, um, and there's a possibility that will, we need to research it, absolutely. And that's what I'm calling for. But operationalizing it right now, I think is way, way premature. And what North Koreans are saying to people, so let me show you here, that was very interesting. Maybe we can go back if I can find this, and I'll talk. Again, just, there's a lot of, 
messaging that's going on here. Here we go. That's going on here with the United with, between the United States and the military. You notice that they shot it like this, right? This is not the exact missile, but they shot another missile that was kind of like this. It could have gone this far, but they did it like this. Why is that? Do you know what countermeasures are? Countermeasures are things that you throw out into the air, and then you're thinking the radar will pick it up, and the radar thinks it's actual missile, and it'll go after that instead of this. So by doing this kind of trajectory enhances the, the countermeasures, because what happens is the countermeasures are dropped over here, and then it spreads all over the place. If you have a narrow trajectory here, countermeasures, they don't work as well. So here's a demonstration of what they were doing. The other thing that I want you to think about is that if you recall, uh, there was a threat to Guam, right? The North Koreans said, we'll, we'll, we'll missile Guam. Um, the reason why they did that is because Guam is the uh, home base of B-1B bombers, which North, that between, I believe it was in May or March to mid-July, there were June, there were 11 bombing runs that went from Guam that would go towards the Korean Peninsula and veer off. So North Korea said, well, you're going to try and intimidate us. We can play that game too. So we're going to say we're going to shoot this missile at, and see what you say to that. So there was all that heightened rhetoric that went over here. Now think about this. So, so Donald Trump said, you can't do that. So what did they do? The next round in September, they shot two missiles. They were the exact missiles. This is to show you the message that's going on. The missiles that they shot, I think it was September, which was August. I got the dates down. When was the 15th? September 15th, one was August, uh, maybe August 28th, was a missile that they shot over Japan. The missile they used was the one, if they wanted to attack Guam, they would have shot it, that missile. And it went the distance it was supposed to go, right? But they decided to shoot it over Japan because one, they knew, and they shot it over the most desolate, unpopulated area of Japan. And so again, they were sending a message, very clear message about what they were trying to do. And they said, you can't hit it. And I would argue that you don't want to try to hit it because if you miss, which is highly likely, then the whole notion of credibility of missile defense goes away. There are a lot of people, and I believe this, that the chance of North Korea giving up its nuclear weapons capability over the short to medium term, I think, is probably zero, very little. There is right now a possibility of getting a short step or a step towards that, which is making sure that North Korea doesn't improve its capability or even has a capability to hit the United States. Um, politically, that's what you need, hit the United States with the ICBMs. Now, for all practical purposes, we have to make sure that we protect the South Koreans and Japan Japanese, and the South Koreans and Japanese have been subject to this threat for quite a while now. Um, so. Right now, there is a possibility, there's a diplomatic solution, but any diplomatic solution has to address those three things that I talked about. Regime survival, but it has to address security, um, some political legitimacy, and recognition for what it can do, and some economic benefits. So some package has to relate to that. And I believe that, sure, if I could wave a wand um, and, um, particularly make sure that North Korea agrees to completely denuclearize and it's all done, sure, I, I'd love to do that. But that's not gonna happen over the short to medium term. So I don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. And so we have to take baby steps in order to do that. That's what I think. So what's happening now is I believe the Trump administration's policies, which is enhanced deterrence and strengthen deterrence is good. I think reliance on sanctions is good. Okay, I think we need to really boost those up. But what has been missing is a real commitment to having dialogue. Um, to, to have, because sanctions alone by themselves are not going to produce what we want. And so the hope is there's a very small window right now because think about it, every eight weeks, North Korea is producing one nuclear weapons worth of material. If we wait too long, by then they're gonna have 40, 50, and then it really doesn't matter at that point. And then North Korea, what they ultimately want to do, they're running on parallel paths. If they can cut a deal, they will cut a deal. But the other path is that they will say, we have X number of nuclear weapons. They, I don't know what it is. They have their number in mind. X number of the nuclear weapons and delivery capability. And what they will probably do at some point, and this is what they're trying to do, and they're sort of slowly doing this, is that once they reach that number, they will go to the United States and they say, okay, 
We have this. You don't have to recognize it, but you know we've got this. We're willing to talk to you about reducing the threat. We want to do arms control. Arms control is what equals do to each other, with each other. You rec don't have to recognize, but you say, how can we reduce the threat and move forward? Disarmament, denuclearization is what a victor does to a vanquished. And one of the things that North Koreans have to understand is now that they have this nuclear capability, all of us are tied together in a way that they can't imagine. Because if they do something, then the whole world will be, at, at, uh, will be, at, will be threatened, including themselves. So this is something, again, that has to be um, explored and discussed. And as I said, we haven't had high-level discussions with North Korea. So I don't know what they want. That's the main thing. I know what generally those are, but I don't know what those things are going to be. And until we have a conversation, I don't know whether or not we can, we can actually provide that. So Donald Trump's, um, if, he were to re, if he were to try to, you know, this is what we talk about all the time, how he deals with the Iran deal is going to have a direct effect on North Koreans. They are looking at this. We have been talking about in many ways as the Iran deal as the prototypical arms deal, I mean prototypical uh, arms control deal. I mean it's an incredible number of pages. And that showed some way in which everyone can save face in a certain respect. Donald Trump, it's not only for North Korea. I mean, clearly, the North Koreans are going to say, well, if we make this deal, he's going to, he's going to change his mind, right? But you know, there's a the larger implications. It's like for everything that we do, there's a credibility issue here. Um, and so that's one of the things about the Iran deal is that I believe that it's not perfect, but it does what it says it's going to do. It has stopped the ways in which Iran can produce a nuclear weapon for a number of years, nuclear material, and it is a start. Now, I don't necessarily disagree with Donald Trump saying that it's better to make a, get, get a better deal. What I mean is you use that deal as the floor and then put together supplemental deals that will make it better. That, that makes sense, but don't kill the foundation of this thing, right? Because then you will end up, I think, just like, uh, like North Korea. And Iran has, will have the potential then to just keep on moving forward and we're not gonna be able to stop it without using force. Um, LA, you know, I don't know what their war plans are, okay? That's the way I would say it, but I, I would think that they're, they're uh, you know, probably high priority places, other places as well. Part of it has to do with distance. LA is relatively far away. What I will say as an observer is that um, the United States and North, the United States and China have to have some strategic discussion. If they want to solve this problem to get what you are talking about, okay, North Korea to stop what they're doing, to stand down a little bit, um, possibly to freeze and then to move forward and hopefully evolve and change, the United States and China have to have a strategic discussion about the future. The future of Asia, and as I said before, specifically about the Korean Peninsula and the disposition of US troops and what that's going to be. If you can do that, because between, as you all know, China, between China and the United States, there's a huge amount of strategic mistrust about what the intentions are. So that has to be a conversation that up to this point, my understanding is that the Chinese have been very loath to talk about. Um, and, you know, to some degree, there's been some reluctance on the United States. Uh, I kind of disagree with your premise a little bit. I mean, maybe that's right, but it's going to be a very long time. They have an intranet, so it's relatively self-enclosed. Um, only people who are politically safe are allowed to have access in certain ways. Um, and, but I do think you're, the other piece of what you're talking about is opening up North Korea will eventually change it and, and I think that's probably true, but we don't know how it's going to change. You're just assuming that more information will make North Korea um, more liberal. I, I don't know if that's necessarily the case. Um, 
I, it may make it more conservative in certain ways. We don't know. Um, but I do think that uh, tactically it makes sense for us to take whatever openings North Korea gives us and then for us to move in and try to make those openings bigger. And um, that's why I'm all for as much kind of exchanges that you can have with, with North Korea. Um, the other thing to think about too, uh, why this may take longer than you anticipate, is that some people look at part of the culture, the myth of the Kim family as almost a cult. And so you see many people who are part of cults who go out into the real world, do all these things, they see all the amazing things that happen, and they go back and they live a very different life and they're perfectly content to do that. So um, it's, it's really hard to tell. That's why I'm talking about unintended consequences. Okay. Thank you.